In 1976, Robert John, then Dean of the School of Engineering of Princeton University, received an unusual request from a student. She wanted to study the effects of human intention on a mechanical device, a random event generator, to test for effects outside conventional physical theory and in the realm of psychokinesis. Skeptical, but with the idea that the design of the device would be a good independent study in any case, John supervised the project. Clearly it was not a usual topic for an undergraduate engineering independent project. And it was not a subject that I had any background in from a scholarly standpoint. In fact, Robert John's background was in the more conventional field of rocket science and aerospace engineering. Plasma propulsion systems like this one were John's forte, and he contributed to a generation of propulsion systems being used on spacecraft today. So, actually what I did was gave her the challenge of convincing me over the course of a couple of months of summer effort that there was enough substance to the topic to make it uh, viable for an undergraduate independent project. And she did that. Was, she was serious enough about it that we could go forward. They did go forward, and three years later, after his student had moved on, John was left pondering inexplicable data. At that point, I had to face, first of all, the possibility that there was substance to the topic, and secondly, that if one could confirm this in a more rigorous program, uh, that it would have substantial implications for the present and future practice of high technology. And so began the Pear Laboratory and a new research interest for John. This is this hip class, right? There's mm -hmm. the lows. Mm -hmm. the nothing with the high. This is the baseline. It's the chi-square that's going to count. After hiring Brenda Dunn as lab manager in 1979, investigations began in earnest. And over many years of trials and many kinds of random devices, the Pear Lab has demonstrated, to a highly significant degree, that the human mind has a small but measurable influence on random physical systems. A lot of what we've learned about the phenomena tends to be what it's not. Uh, what we can say for sure is that the phenomena are real. They are not chance fluctuations. Something is going on. There is a subtle ordering process that is influencing these otherwise random events. To the extent that one can summarize, what we find is that the uh, human mind and the information processing machines seem to be entering into some sort of a dialogue which influences both the machine and uh, the human mind that is interacting with it. The data that has engaged John and Dunn for close to 30 years comes from two different classes of experiment. The first class is based on a similar idea to that of the original student project. This random event generator is essentially an electronic coin flipper. According to statistics, if you flip a coin 10 times, you would expect to get five heads. If you got six heads, you wouldn't think much of it. But if you flip the coin 10 million times, and got six million heads, you would know that some process was having an influence on the outcome. This machine does 200 flips per second. When left unattended, it performs in a statistically normal way. And over time, it approximates a chance mean of 100. But when an operator is present, wishing for the output to be higher or lower, the output deviates very slightly from the chance expectation. The effect shown on these devices is small, only a few flips in 10,000 are influenced by the operator. But those few are more than contemporary physics can explain. And the effect is not limited to these electronic devices. The Pear Lab has explored many sources of random event generation. A little shift to the right. So all of our devices share the features, that they are based on some form of random physical process as their source. They are capable of calibration, and in most cases they are capable of a theoretical expectation. 
York Dobbins, a theoretical physicist who joined the staff in 1987, has done much of the statistical analysis and has considerable interaction with the critics of Pear's work. They pick out things like, do operators cheat? Do operators have a chance to meddle with the data? Do our statistics really mean what we think they mean? Um, uh, what are the possible physical confounds, such as ordinary electricity, magnetism, and what have you? Um, of course, we've had years to refine the experiments and think about possible loopholes that we can then plug. With the REGs, for example, they are shielded against most of the uh, sorts of, of interference that you can think of. The process of mechanical design at PAIR involves extensive calibration and testing to search out and eliminate artifacts in the data that correlate with known physical processes. These designs were abandoned because they could not be sufficiently insulated to produce truly random data. Temperature and pressure created artifacts in this Crookes tube design, this dual thermistor design, and another using photoelastic stress. The first fountain design showed acoustic artifacts. Another machine responded too sensitively to vibrations in the building. The machines that do survive pairs testing and go on to be used in experimental work are known to be completely free of interference from known physical processes and produce random data that fit chance expectations. Uh, we calibrate our ex experiments extensively under uh, actual working conditions and find that in, in the calibrations they produce data that are uh, consistent with the null hypothesis. Um, and finally, for most of our experiments, we use a tripolar protocol in which the only difference is um, some aspect of, of the human being's mental state. Basically, any um, physical confound that uh, you can come up with has to be uh, not only able to um, get through all of the shielding and equipment design and for some reason not be present while the machine is calibrating, but it needs to be smart enough to track what the operator is doing subjectively. Through the years of refining experiments in statistical processes, this unexplained phenomenon remains. The resistance by mainstream science has also continued and has created many difficulties not the least of which is the dissemination of their work. Well, how do you go through the scientific process of peer review and et cetera, et cetera, if you can't have peers, if you're not allowed to present the data and you're not allowed to deal with it critically on a rational scientific level? So you end up getting irresponsible criticism. You end up getting... Um, uh, unreasonable rejection, not on the basis of the quality of the work, but on the topical matter. Uh, in my view, that's not science. That's not what science is about. Science is about opening your mind to learn something new. It's not saying, this is something I don't want to hear about. This is the sort of thing, as one critic said, I wouldn't believe in even if it was true. And one of the things that has become fairly evident in the history of, of the field is that the, uh, the, the, the definition of what constitutes an overwhelming weight of evidence and what constitutes impeccable documentation uh, tends to get more and more stringent as the evidence and the documentation accumulates. Even if mainstream scientific journals have not considered their work, the popular media has not been shy. The Pear Lab has received much press coverage over the years, and the popular response to the work is generally positive. Mind over matter, it used to be just a figure of speech, right? If I flip this coin, I'm supposed to have a 50-50 chance. So can people affect objects and machines with their minds? It would appear they can. The phenomena are real. Uh, they aren't just due to chance effects. They're small, uh, but those small effects comp compound over many, many occurrences. They don't seem to be associated with processes that we think of as cognitive. We don't see things like learning curves. We don't see 
any of the usual things associated with cognitive, perceptual psychology. We know that they tend to appear uh, more a beginner's luck effect or serious position effect, where people tend to do better the first time. We notice that the, they seem to be distributed across the entire distributions of the outputs. It's as if uh, the probabilities are being changed rather than the physical activity. Um, we've seen these cooperator effects where people of opposite sex or and especially people of opposite sex who are bonded couples are resonant with each other tend to get stronger effects than individuals. The field reg data have shown us that we get effects when we're in groups of people in environments where there are a lot of people who are on the same wavelength. Uh, we have seen gender differences. Males and females, on average, produce different characteristics in their data. Uh, they are independent of distance and time. Uh, all of these things, of course, are challenging uh, any attempts to model them because these, these things just don't fit with our, our prevailing understanding of the way the world works. Compounding the results across all of our experiments, all of the time we have been operating, you then come out saying that the results you find in this composite database are unlikely by chance to better than one part in 10 to the 12th. That's one part in a trillion. This is far more stringent than any science experiment I'm aware of requires for its validation. The physical theories need to be expanded for their purposes, for the purposes they have been applied in other sectors. They are remarkably effective and accurate. But in situations such as we're dealing with here, where we are exploring interactions between the human mind and random physical processes, they lack several important ingredients. Uh, whether or not the ultimate theories of these phenomena will follow in a strictly basing format, I honestly don't know. But I do know that we cannot expect the sort of rigid causal determinism replication that has uh, ennobled much of our science in other areas. To find out how this phenomenon works is a puzzle that will remain long after the pair lab is gone. Pear's theoretical models are only the beginning of the search. So much of Pear's effort has been toward trying to demonstrate, trying to convince, trying to make the case that the phenomena are real. Uh, the, the, the next level of inquiry is, okay, they're real. What are they? How do they work? Where do they apply? Yeah, the search is indeed for the mechanism by which such information is acquired, or indeed possibly even created. I think Pear has done what Pear had to do. There's just so many random binary events that you can generate. If we haven't made our point with the databases we've accumulated over the last quarter century, we're not going to make it. But to take it further, to talk about the implications and how that may affect other fields, that's for the next generation to do. These experiments, technically speaking, are not difficult. The phenomena, conceptually speaking, are extraordinarily difficult. If indeed, as we contend, these events are intrinsically, subjectively driven, then it follows clearly that the researcher must be experiencing them himself. So don't take our word for it, don't take others' words for it, go off and try it yourself and come to your own conclusions based on your own experience.